So if you're really interested with our workshops and conferences, you can see here, this is our schedule for the upcoming year. Our next one's gonna be at Harvard. We're gonna have another workshop, um, one gonna be in MIT. We're gonna have one in um, Silicon Valley, another one at USC, one in Washington. So we're pretty booked throughout this whole year and we're really excited to meet you guys. Um, if you ever wanna reach out, we have our Facebook page for ideas. We have a LinkedIn page and you can also contact me, Kyle or Jason all through LinkedIn. We'll be more than happy to talk with you. And also back to this, since we're growing really quickly, we're also um, trying to do two new things for ideas. We're having our certificate program, which includes SQL, R, Python, and some NLP and recommendation systems. And in regards to that, we're also gonna come up with our new bootcamp. So this is a data science intensive bootcamp, 16 weeks. If you're really interested, um, the perks is that you're gonna be mentored by three really great data scientists. Again, Kyle, Jason, Peter. Um, one involving machine learning course. We have a big data module and a um, statistics and probability module. So covering everything from data science to data engineering all in one. But enough of that, we're here to get a lot of insights from Kyle. So I would like to pass this down to you and go take it off from here. Sounds good. Let me share my screen. I'll pull up some slides I have. It'll be coming up now, but it'll take a second. Give me a heads up when you got it so I know I'm good to proceed. Anything yet? Should be up, I would expect. Yeah, we see it. Okay, great. So this is my uh, quick presentation on how to be a data scientist. It's some of my experience, both as a, you know, someone who started early in my career and, and took this path long before we had the, te the term data scientist and someone who is now a, you know, business owner and before this a major hiring manager, pulling in a lot of people from diverse backgrounds and academia and different industries. Um, so kind of a blending of all those experiences into some advice that I hope will be helpful for you. So I'm going to outline this in three general ways. First, about the skills you need to be a successful data scientist. Second, about experience and how to gain it. And lastly, about where the opportunities are, both now and in the future. <clears throat> so in terms of skills, I like to think of what a data scientist needs in three general categories, methods, diagnostics, and tools. Now, there's a lot I could have also put in here in terms of business acumen, which I'm sure you know is very important for data science, con convincing the decision makers and stakeholders how to leverage your work and your recommendations. But the core of what a data scientist actually does outside of those negotiating and soft skills really come down to these three things. So methods are the techniques, the algorithms you might need, the um, statistical approaches, those sorts of things. Diagnostics are the statistical and sometimes just numeric procedures that we can use to evaluate the quality of our work and also to do better optimization, which we'll talk about in further detail. And then lastly, it's the tools, because once you know the methods, you still need to know how to implement them. And the reality is to be a successful data scientist, you're probably not going to code your own algorithms. Maybe as you become very advanced and you get into one specific use case, but in general, you're going to be using tools available on the market, um, essentially so you don't get passed over because those allow you to move quickly. And if you try and do everything manually, someone else will move uh, more quickly than you will. So breaking down methods now, I would say there are some core competencies you wanna develop mastery in, and then some adjacencies that I'll mention that I think are useful for a data scientist, but we'll start with the core. So at the core, uh, I put statistical techniques on top because if you don't have stats, I don't believe you can really be all that successful as a data scientist. Um, doesn't mean you have to be an expert in statistics, but fundamentally data science is about asking questions of your data and then coming up with evidence-based decisions that are motivated by that decision. So data is only as useful as the decisions it helps your organization make and figuring out how to convert that data and, and test questions appropriately all comes down to statistical techniques. 
naturally machine learning falls into this as well. And a lot of the people who call themselves data scientists might perhaps just call themselves machine learning engineers in a, you know, a different sort of titling system. Machine learning is all the collection of techniques that are algorithmic designed at automating the process of deriving patterns and insights out of your data. Um, SQL is one that's very important. I'm sure everyone's heard of that, or at least I expect so. Many of you will have even had some exposure to it, maybe in classes and these sorts of things. It was my experience, and uh, not just in terms of my own professional development, but in what I've noticed when I hire people straight out of school. You may think you know SQL, but the odds are you probably don't know SQL, uh, at least not until you get into a real world setting where you're writing ad hoc queries and trying to figure out real world data. So definitely know, you know, select from where all these important concepts in SQL, definitely learn the methods and the, the format, but be prepared to dig deep into SQL. I don't think you really learn it until you get your hands dirty. Stochastic optimization is a terminology some of you may or may not be familiar with. It's uh, generally the domain of operations research, although there's a strong overlap between data science and operations research. These are the techniques, primarily numeric optimization techniques, that allow you to work and find optimal solutions under uncertainty. A classic example of this is supply chain optimization. Let's assume you work for a company that builds some product. That product is probably uh, created using a lot of different resources, whether those be subcontractor deliverables or commodity materials, or uh, you, know, you buy a certain part from a certain factory. It can be very tricky to make sure you put all your orders in at the right time, such that you're not warehousing too much material and also that you don't run out and you take care of uh, things that could fail or, or, or um, you could have losses from some of your materials. Defining rigidly a, a business problem like that uh, then defining all the constraints on the problem and finding an optimal numeric solution to those difficult problems is broadly speaking the process of stochastic optimization. So it's a technique a lot of people don't get exposed to when they search just the typical Googling of data science, but it's a field you should definitely have some familiarity with because it can separate you strongly apart from people who only know the basics. Gradient descent is one of the great algorithms in data science. It's available so that, or it's, it's used to find, often in those stochastic optimization techniques, but a lot of machine learning algorithms use this under the hood. If there's one sort of algorithm you should know very well, it's probably gradient descent. Um, time series analysis is the collection of techniques that look at data that comes in a sequence. So the classic example would be like stock market data. And if you want to do, uh, be a quantitative analysis uh, person, then you obviously do need some time series analysis work. However, I have found that there is time series analysis data at every company I've ever worked for, consulted for, or had as a client. Um, if you have servers, then your servers are monitored. That's time series data. You know, what memory consumption is, what the CPU usage is. If you have revenue, which let's hope your employer has revenue, that's time series data. And there's a lot of modeling that can be done around these sorts of patterns. Lastly, I list uh, experimental design as one of the core methods you should know. Nothing is more crucial than good experimental design. The obvious application of this is A-B testing. Let's say you work for a company that has a website. Maybe that website is aimed at selling products. You'd like to make the, enhance the website to make it easier and more efficient for customers to come there and make a purchase when they want to. You do that through small iterative changes. You know, should we lower the price, raise the price, put the button in the top left or top right? These sorts of questions. Um, if you don't set up a proper experiment, you're highly susceptible to derive a spurious answer. You can see some things like this uh, coming out in the news now. There was someone from the Cornell Food Lab who has recently been exposed as doing some very dodgy mathematics and poor experimental design. Essentially, uh, a career of their research has now all been uh, put in a quite suspect framework. Maybe it's all going to be invalidated, all because good experimental design wasn't done. Um, so. It doesn't matter how fancy of a technique you have or what advanced algorithms you know if you're not applying the basics. So uh, experimental design is one of those fundamental things you should be aware of. A couple of adjacent things. These aren't necessarily part of data science, but I mention them because they're areas that overlap a lot. And the combination of the core and one or two adjacent things can often give you a strategic advantage in your career. Signal processing. Uh, hey, Randy, maybe you want to mute? 
Yeah. Signal processing is the domain of studying mostly the fast Fourier transformation. It comes up a lot in broadcast and in a lot of industrial applications. Um, we see it now somewhat in image and audio recognition. So if you're interested in those areas, it's a, something to get into. Information theory is a, a domain in and of itself, but it overlaps strongly with the fundamentals of machine learning. So as you get advanced in machine learning, you should learn more information theory. Computational complexity theory is the study of algorithms and how long they will take to, to run. Um, these are things you absolutely should learn as you progress. Maybe you don't need them as you search for your first job, but understanding how long your techniques will take and how they will scale up is critical, and that's the domain of complexity theory. Uh, control systems are an exciting area, especially if you're interested in AI. These are the simplest control system I'm aware of is your home thermostat. It takes measurements and input data from the ambient uh, atmosphere, and then it figures out whether or not the, third, the heating or cooling system should be turned on or off. That is a very simple idea, but it scales up quite well, and self-driving cars fit the same paradigm. They are control systems. So uh, it's an area you should get into, especially if you're interested in AI. Um, lastly, I put graph theory, and I could have put a thousand other things. This list is somewhat arbitrary or maybe biased in my experience, but graph theory is the study of the mathematics of networks. Um, this would be very useful if you were to go to work at a social network like Facebook or LinkedIn. But even other places can study, you know, the overlap of customer bases or interactions of that kind. So a lot of powerful tools in graph theory, not proper data science per se, but combined with these techniques can be exceptionally powerful. Machine learning and graph theory is definitely a winning combination. So I'd mentioned diagnostics. I'm gonna run through a few of these things and tell you a little bit about where you use them and why. So precision and recall are, are the two sort of maybe most popular you've heard of. Precision is, um, I'll talk about in terms of a search engine. So imagine you go to Google and you search for uh, some topic. You expect that the results you get back are related to that topic. And, and largely that's true at Google. Very often you see a low precision. Um, not always the case in other applications. Maybe you could build some recommender system for a small e-commerce company. And if you just, you know, do a quick weekend project, while you might get it up and running, odds are the precision is going to be low, meaning that you will make certain recommendations which are really not appropriate for that customer because your system needs a little bit more, you know, TLC. Recall is the, so precision is the percentage of the recommendations that would be good recommendations. Recall is a measure of out of all of the recommendations you had that you could have given, how many of the good ones did you pull back? So you can see how this relates to false positives and false negatives. In precision, if you show something you shouldn't have, that's a false positive or a type one error. In recall, if you fail to show something you should have shown, that's a false negative or type two error. <clears throat> Depending on your circumstance, you'll want to minimize one or both of these. So I could see where in a hospital diagnosis project, you don't want to give a, a false positive, right? You want, don't want to tell a healthy person that they're sick. However, if you think, hey, you might be sick, come back for more testing, that's probably okay. So false positives, while not good in medical, they're tolerable in certain contexts. The opposite, a false negative, where you tell a sick person that they don't have a problem, this is really bad because they might leave and not come back for the service they need. They might pursue non-medical services and non-science-based approaches, um, which would, uh, are not going to help them. So uh, depending on your circumstances, what the problem is, you'll want to control for one or the other of these. So knowing not just how to calculate it, but how it's important to your problem at hand is key. Um, accuracy is a related idea, it's just the, how many you got correct in some sort of scenario. F1 score is like the harmonic mean, if you're familiar with that. It combines precision and recall. So if you're looking to optimize for one parameter and you have a notion of, of the preference and the trade-off between those two, the F1 score is applicable. Um, I probably should add area under the curve and receiver ROC curve, receiver operator characteristic curve. These are techniques that complement these others well. Um, concordance is one that's interesting when you rank things. So let's say you were trying to predict the outcome of the Olympics. You would like to predict the, you know, the person you say is likely to win should get the gold medal. The person you say is likely to be second place should get silver and bronze and so on and so forth. So 
if you line up everybody well, you would have a very high concordance. But let's say you ordered them incorrectly and you predicted gold for bronze and uh, that would be far off, right? So concordance would be, would be low. Um, so depending on uh, if you're working some sort of rank scenario, concordance is the way to go. R squared is a measure of the correlation between two different variables. So if you're trying to predict from the features you have available to, let's say, uh, a prediction of how much revenue a customer is going to spend, you could uh, analyze that with the R squared. You should know about p-values, um, mean, standard deviation, and once you get these two, you should learn about skewness and kurtosis. They won't come up quite as often, but they're important to know. Um, diversity and serendipity are metrics really only relevant in the recommendation system, recommendation system community, but I thought I'd mention them here because I think they're kind of novel. Diversity is interesting. You wouldn't want diversity on Google. You know, if I search for data science, I want all the topics to be about data science. I don't want one to randomly be about chess, let's say. Um, diversity, on the other hand, if you think about going and searching for products or movies or things like that, you might like to be suddenly surprised or to see recommendations of different kinds. Maybe you like both comedies and horror movies. You should show a mix of both. Serendipity is the rate at which people find novel discoveries. So maybe you suggest uh, a kid's movie to someone that doesn't watch a lot of kid's movies. And if they, they suddenly like it, that's a serendipitous moment. And that can be something of value if you're building a recommender system. So depending on your domain and problem, you might need more specific uh, diagnostics like that. Value of information is an important one that is not as widely known as some of these others. It's a, a metric for measuring how useful data is. So you need to think of two options. Let's say you have a decision to make, like should you buy a used car? You can buy it blindly uh, without knowing the state of the car, and maybe you bought a good car, maybe you didn't. Or you can pay to have an inspection done by a mechanic, and the mechanic will rate that car for you. Now, if the mechanic has a high precision, if they're a good mechanic and they tell you accurately the state of that vehicle, you are much more informed afterwards to make a smart decision. So the value of, what is the value of that information then essentially? What is the, the, the worth of the mechanics report? Well, it's the utility you would get if you decided without the information, so just made a blind decision, minus the utility you would get if you made the value, sorry, uh, let me start that over. If you have the information, so you got the mechanics report, you can make the most informed decision. So you can calculate your expected utility there. If you uh, make the decision using only your gut instinct and you don't have the report, you're probably not going to make as good of a decision, but you don't have the cost. So it's uh, the utility of deciding with the information minus the decision you could make without the information minus the cost of the information. So if that report was prohibitively expensive for some reason, maybe you wouldn't order it. But most likely when buying a car, you want the mechanic to look at it. Their fee is going to be less than the value of the information, so you go for it. And there's many, many more of these. Diagnostics are so important because we live in the big data era. You're not going to be able to review every training case or all the different corner cases that your work will have to cover. As a result, you need to have some way of uh, studying or scanning across all of your data set and learning the characteristics of the models you build so that you can know exactly what you need out of these. Um, I'm gonna move along to tools. I see some questions coming in. Uh, maybe Randy, you could prioritize those. I'll take a, a break and we can kind of run through some of them. Um, this is a, also a finite list of some of the tools I recommend everyone know. The two premier languages far and wide for data science are R and Python. Um, you should have familiarity with at least one of these, ideally both. You don't really need both, because most jobs you're not going to do both, but you should at least have an understanding of what each has to offer. I work with both in my daily life and have for many, many years. Um, I pick which tool to use based on what the work is, and uh, not to say that one language is better than another in certain situations. That's kind of true. You know, uh, certain language of those two languages are stronger for certain things than others. Sometimes one has a better library than another or whatever. But also, you will have a familiarity and a comfort level with each of them um, that uh, you'll need to decide for yourself which is the best one. Sorry, I'm going to have to move the bird. It's getting a little noisy. I apologize for the disruption. Give me one second. Okay, so uh, this is Jason. Uh, sorry for the interruption. 
Uh, we are going to have the online conference as a regular, you know, maybe once. Sorry about that, guys. So if you have any, you know, topic you are interested in, please, you know, text to us in the Q&A window. So uh, we are looking for the new topics. If you have any topic related to artificial intelligence, data science, you can just text us. We will, you know, uh, look for the speakers for you and uh, host the online conference as a regular. Thank you. Kyle, you can continue. Sounds good. Spark is a technology you want to get familiar with. Oh, thank you for the shout out to my bird Yoshi. Um, Spark is the distributed, the premier distributed computing platform. Um, it's open source and its founders have a commercial venture called Databricks, which is one of the premier platforms for doing Spark, although you can do it in lots of environments, including setting up your own cluster if you choose to. Spark is very powerful and, and pretty much required if you're going to work on big data problems. It uh, is, a, as I said, a distributed computing system. Um, which means it's going to run across a cluster of computers. And there are trade-offs and pros and cons in that that you should learn about. So if you have a small problem, Spark can be more of a burden than a help. If you can solve it on a single computer with a, you know, a big box with a lot of memory, you might want to solve your problem in R or Python. It really depends, and it's something you'll have to get into. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you shouldn't expect to write any machine learning algorithms, at least not in the early stages of your career, and probably not ever, to be quite frank. The existing libraries that are out there, um, sklearn in Python is a quite popular one. R has a lot of different libraries, because R tends to be more you know, smaller libraries than big monoliths, the way Python tends to be. Um, but whatever your language of choice, find out the machine learning libraries and learn them quite well. sklearn and, and many of the equivalencies in R are highly, highly optimized to do very specific uh, tasks and do them in a very memory and CPU optimized way. Even if you were to implement your own and do it bug free, which is unlikely, it's going to be much slower than the available ones. So while your courses, if you're in school or, or taking boot camps or things like that, maybe someone would ask you to implement one from scratch and that could be a healthy exercise in understanding machine learning, but ultimately use other people's tools. Um, unless you're a senior level person who's now solving a very specialized problem. AWS stands for Amazon Web Services. Um, there are other cloud platforms such as Microsoft's Azure and Google's uh, Cloud Compute Engine. Um, then there are smaller players like Heroku and others. So I'm not trying to push a vendor or anything like that. AWS is just the uh, largest by quite a long shot. So um, become aware of it or another cloud platform. That may sound like something a data scientist doesn't need to do, right? You know, we're going to do machine learning and algorithms. Let's let the software engineers figure out AWS. And for the most part, they will. They'll take care of all the minutia and server work and that kind of thing. But more and more, technologies are being commoditized, and your data science in the future will be built upon the tools of other people. When I came up in my career, I built a lot of stuff like counter systems and little in-memory storage things to make my work possible. And I did that out of necessity. I don't have to do those things anymore. I will never write another queue in my life because I can use Amazon's queue. And they have some of the best people in queuing in the world making sure that their system can stand the test of time. Um, so you won't win the battle trying to compete with them on the storage and database side, things like that. So take advantage of the tools they provide you, things like queues, um, you know, uh, DynamoDB, which is a, a quick uh, document store, systems like that are, can be very valuable to you as a data scientist and allow you to get a lot more done without the involvement of others. Distributed systems, I'd mentioned, pretty much go learn Spark. I don't need to have a separate bullet for that. Streaming is a major topic. Uh, you don't necessarily have to get into streaming as a data scientist, but more and more things are going this way. Algorithms are being rewritten and refigured to be able to learn on the fly. And there's a strong desire in business for this area. I'm not saying that everything will be streaming, but we're going to see a lot more headed in this direction. We already have. Serverless is another important concept. Again, somewhat tangential to what it is to be a data scientist, but it's something that's important for getting your work deployed to production. Serverless is the idea that you don't really write any server code. So if you have a project to deploy, 
you don't set up a machine and then have people start making a request to it and need to maintain that. In serverless, you just give your function or your code to a system like AWS Lambda functions or Azure functions. And it can be called as much as it needs to be. It's designed to run in a very short period of time, usually no more than a few seconds. And then um, there isn't a lot of maintenance to it. So as I mentioned early in my career, I spent a lot of time setting up and maintaining servers to get my tools available to the company that I worked for. Now I much prefer when it makes sense to do serverless architecture. I write something once, I install it as a Lambda function, and then I just give it to people and I don't have to worry about scaling or anything like that. It's all taken care of for me. I get to focus on the data science because I learned about serverless. Um, Jupyter Notebooks and IDEs. You should already know about Jupyter Notebooks, or I guess know about Jupyter Lab because that's the new incarnation that seems to be superseding the old version. Um, you definitely want to have tools to be able to make your work more efficient. Jupyter is the premier one, I would say, for data scientists, but other IDs like PyCharm will come in handy as you do different system level development. Um, and lastly, I just want to emphasize a lot of people ask me, you know, do I need to know how to program to be a data scientist? And the answer is yes. Um, the answer used to be maybe, you know, sometimes you can get by being an advisor, this sort of thing, but the reality is if you want to be effective, you need to be a strong programmer. Now, that doesn't mean strong in knowing all of the languages and all of the best practices for how to indent your code and stuff like that. Let software engineers waste their time worrying about stuff like that. You just need to worry about making your data science visions a reality, and to do that, you're going to need to code. Let's get into some experience questions. Um, and Randy, feel free to interrupt me if you think there's questions pertaining to the material I've covered so far that we should do some questions on. Yeah, so we have a couple of them and three really stood out. So if you have the time to answer it right now, I could share. For sure, let's get into it. Yeah, so one of them, I'll post it on the chat. So from Fanny, can you see it? Yep. What is the best way to learn data science since it has a lot involved and could be applications in various fields? Is it to learn and then apply or learn by applying techniques on data sets? Great question. I would say it's a little bit of both. And I'll cover some more of this when I talk about these experience slides in a bit. But um, you, know, you can study your whole life and then try and get out into the so-called real world and people will say, we don't want you on our team because you don't have any experience. Um, in the same way, if you don't learn anything and you rush out, they'll say, well, you don't have any skills to bring. So I find it's a combination and it's also a very personal thing. Um, the best way to learn for me personally, for Kyle, is to learn by doing. I go and I read a new research paper or I learn about some library. I go to a lot of conferences to see demos of cool stuff that's coming out. And then I immediately go assign myself a pet project to, to work on that. Sometimes my pet projects become real things like open source projects or little widgets I can involve in my website or stuff like that. Other times they're just things that sit in my GitHub repository and don't do anything, but I've developed the skill set by doing. That's how I personally learn best. You'll have to figure out how you learn best. Um, some people learn really well reading a textbook. Others need a lecture. Others need a classroom with peers. Um, those are personal things. There's no right or wrong answer. But Data, is a, data science is a very hands-on thing. The examples you'll see in a lot of classrooms and textbooks are there to be very sanitized and show you the methods. What you'll find in the quote unquote real world is that data is very messy and you spend a lot of time cleaning it or not even just cleaning it, but understanding it. And as a result, I don't think you can really fully be a data scientist until you're out there doing things on real data sets. It's almost like a, reading strategy books about how to play a sport like basketball. I'm sure there are good books on how to play basketball, but you've just got to get on the court if you want to be successful. But good question. And if you have time, there's really one more that I really found interesting. Let's so do it. I'll post it right now it's from Protect. Kyle, how would one qualify, quantify value of information? It seems like defining utility function can be fairly arbitrary. What are different considerations that might come into play here? Excellent question. I'm glad you dug into this. Um, yes, defining a utility function could be arbitrary. Um, so if, if my idea is, hey, um, I want to launch a, a brand new company and I'm going to get a little focus group and ask people what they think of my idea and use that to decide if I should move forward. 
I'm not saying focus groups aren't valuable, but I don't think they're valuable in a numeric way like this. Value of information is much more applicable in algorithmic type things. So let's talk about algorithmic trading um, as an example use case. You know, you're working for some hedge fund and they're going to decide what trades to execute or not. There's outside information they can get, like an earnings report, or maybe uh, there's some little startup that says they're doing data mining stuff on Twitter and they're going to get the sentiment of companies off of Twitter and give you that as a signal. I don't personally think that'd be very useful for investing, but I could be wrong. Um, in that case, ask yourself the question. And actually, this is exactly how you evaluate whether or not it's valuable. You figure out, well, if I had had some information and I had done my trades using that data, how much money would I have made? And then if I had kept to my old strategy, making trades without this information, what sort of revenue would I have earned? And you can do that exactly in an experiment or maybe through some you know, back trading or things like that. And you can calculate exactly the difference. And if the information is valuable, you should be able to trade better given the information. So how much better you did given the information minus what you expect to have made without it minus its cost is its value. Um, so that's like a best case scenario where you can get very specific about the value. You're absolutely right to be a little suspicious. Um, if someone's trying to arbitrarily assign values like, well, we think, um, I don't know, a website visit or a mailing list sign up is worth a certain amount. It's a little questionable how you measure that. But uh, when applicable to your problem, it's a powerful metric. Cool. Well, we'll have more time at the end for sure. Um, I can even potentially stay a little longer and do some questions. So let's move on to the experience portion. Um, I'm going to divide this into a couple sections, pre-experience, career, knowing the tools and lifelong learning. I'll mostly focus on pre-career because typically when we run these, it's people still in school or getting out of school, or maybe you're at your first job. Um, so technically having a first job, where, you know, you're not really pre-career, but a lot of people still feel like they're on the path. So this is where I'll spend most of my attention, but I'm happy to feel uh, questions about what it's like when you're a more senior professional as well. <clears throat> So pre-career experience, as I'm sure you're hearing, you know, employers want to know what experience do you have? What do you bring to the table that's unique? And it can be frustrating as a young professional because how can you have any experience when you're looking for your first job? Um, and that can seem like a catch-22, right? And, or a glass ceiling or something that's hard to get past. Um, so we can complain about it or we can find a way around it. And here are some suggestions I have. You have school projects, your courses assigned you things. Um, maybe there's one you have or have chosen to, or can now choose to go above and beyond on. Put it on your GitHub, make a little website, do a talk at a meetup, get that talk on YouTube. Find ways to exhibit your work that sets you aside from your peers. Internships, when you get them, are great. Um, it's a good opportunity to see how companies function, to learn about corporate culture, and to take on a cool project. Um, it also helps a lot in opening doors. I know many people who end up getting hired by the places where they intern. It's a very common path. Um, even when you don't, that on your resume makes you stand out more than someone who doesn't have that. The gig economy is a huge opportunity that I wish had been around when I was uh, in, in an undergrad. I had more time on my hands and I was eager to spend my free time working on projects. And frankly, I could have used them extra money. At that time, it was hard to consult. You'd have to find someone, just uh, sort of like uh, typical business does today, talk through a contract, get into a deal with them, and it's you know a big commitment. The gig economy on sites like Upwork, uh, Upwork and I guess maybe Elance is still around, places like that, you might be able to find short-term data science projects you can do for people. Sometimes these will be simple, like a small business needs you to do some analysis on a spreadsheet or something like that. Um, these are good opportunities that you can look at. There are just ways you can go through those sites and see what you might qualify for, make a little money, but most of all, get experienced. And they're often short-term, simple projects, which is great for building up a resume or getting some introductory, quick experience. Personal projects are always good. Find something you're passionate about, invest a lot of time in it, and use it to exhibit your skills, also to build them. There's volunteer work. Organizations like Datakind and Bayes Impact help connect uh, eager professionals um, of all backgrounds, with, of all technical backgrounds, with different organizations that need data scientists to help them. Um, a famous example, there was a woman I interviewed on the Data Skeptic podcast. She was working at Pivotal, 
and took kind of a sabbatical to go work for a company called Crisis Text Line. They're a place with, where people in need, maybe uh, people who have thoughts of suicide or things like that, need a counselor to speak to. Rather than call, they can do this via text. And she helped them get their database set up and do some analytical work on those and essentially help them deliver better value to the people in need. Um, many great opportunities for volunteering like that. Of course, books, conferences, paper, lecture videos, uh, these go without saying, and I think you should be fairly easy to find some of these. If you don't know about the archive for papers, this is a, an excellent resource. Uh, I'll pull this up since it's spelled a little weird, arxiv.org. This is the preprint repository where tons of people now post all their work. It could actually be a little overwhelming, but there's no shortage of great papers and stats, computer science, and data science related topics. So uh, I check here two or three times a week for interesting research, and that's how I keep up. Um, lastly, domain knowledge. If you can get something about an industry that becomes a little bit of an area of expertise for you, that's gonna set you far and wide ahead of a lot of other candidates. This could be something simple like maybe, you know, during high school, you worked part-time at a real estate office and you learned the ropes, you know about the MLS and you know about how agents operate. Well, if you have that expertise in that field, you're more attractive to one of these companies that's eager to disrupt real estate. And I can guarantee you that's going to be a major change in the next year. Um, the way that industry runs is going to completely revolutionize. It's very behind the time. So if you can find some industry like that or any industry and develop an expertise in it, combining that with what you know about data science can be an excellent winning combination for you. Um, I can't stress enough, though, that you need to build things. Data scientists, uh, even though maybe we'd like to think some of us are just these brilliant people that go into a room with whiteboards and we draw formulas on there and uh, then people come in and scribble it down and go implement the great vision. This is rarely the case. And, and I would be surprised if more than two or three people in the world have a job actually like that. For the most part, you need to build things, uh, different machine learning models and stuff like that. And you need to make it possible for those systems to integrate with the rest of the technical infrastructure of a company or organization. So this shouldn't be a chore. You really should enjoy this. If you don't enjoy building models and doing statistical analysis, you might not want to be in data science. That's what it's all about. So uh, if you want to stay motivated, build things you care about, especially build things that you want to show people. That's the only way they're going to help you get ahead. Uh, make your work available. You should all have a GitHub page. If you don't, go right after this and work on it. Get interesting things on your GitHub page so people can see what you're capable of. And market your work. You know, it, it seems like, hey, we should spend all of our time learning and practicing and getting better, and that's important. But you also have to let people know what you're capable of. So don't forget to spend, you know, maybe 5% of your time marketing what you do and who you are. That's building your resume, online portfolio, all that kind of good stuff. A um, little bit more on domain knowledge, as I would mentioned. Um, it is somewhat critical for success. Doesn't mean you can't get a job without domain knowledge, but the success you'll achieve at that job is gonna depend entirely on how well you understand the mechanics of that business. And the reality is, I'll tell you this firsthand, for me to be successful, I often had to become more knowledgeable about the mechanics of the businesses I worked for than the CEOs were. Um, so expect to learn a lot and to study and ask a lot of questions. This is also an easy way to increase your salary and value. If you're the person who knows exactly how the organization runs and how everything fits together and operates, um, then you're invaluable because you can know how to influence that. Teamwork is critical at big organizations. I don't need to harp too much on this, but make sure you know who your collaborators are and how to best add value to what they do. Um, tools. So broadly speaking, I've already mentioned Jupyter. Docker is another tool you should know about. Um, it's a containerization platform. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I'll just give you the one liner. It's the tool that you use to solve the problem when you say, well, it worked on my computer. I don't know why it doesn't work on your computer. Docker makes that go away. And it solves a lot of other critical issues. Everything I build anymore is built inside of Docker. And when I make deliveries to my clients, I give them a Docker container. Um, the advantages of that are all of my data science work is encapsulated. No one else can break it or, you know, do things to kind of make it not work correctly. And the people who I give that to know exactly how to plug it into their systems. And they don't have to worry about how to configure the system I built very much. Um, as I mentioned, R or Python, you want to learn these languages. 
There are other important languages worth looking at. Uh, Go is one, Haskell, Scala, um, maybe Julia, uh, but predominantly R and Python are what you need to know. And if you know these well, the others will come along. Um, in terms of algorithms, you should know logistic regression. You should know XGBoost. You should know about SQL in some variety, MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, whatever the case may be. You should also know about microservice architecture. This is a design philosophy that says when you build things, you shouldn't build big monolithic systems. You should build small systems that all collaborate with one another. So if we think of a company like Uber, Uber doesn't have one big software base. They have a bunch of teams that work on a bunch of different things. So when you open up your Uber or your Lyft app, one of the things it does, it shows you nearby cars. Odds are there's a microservice at Uber that that's all it does. You make a call to it and say, here's my lat long, what are the nearby cars? And it just gives you that data that streams where they are and how they're moving. It doesn't handle billing, it doesn't do anything else. And this is important for a data scientist because ultimately, how data science affects a business is precisely in this way. You identify a key decision that the company needs to make. If it's like a lending company, that decision is, should you issue credit to someone, yes or no? Or maybe it's, if you're going to issue credit at what uh, annual percentage interest rate should you issue it? That's a decision. So all of the inputs are the things, the data that the business knows about it, and the output is either a yes or no or a number or something like that. You want to isolate all of the things that are not important to that. You know, like is the person, um, you know, a Visa or MasterCard? Maybe that could matter in, in some very small way, but most likely no. Set aside all the details that uh, have to happen in the technology stack. Isolate just the core decision. Figure out what inputs go into it and what its output is and build a microservice that just does that one simple thing and does it very well. That's exactly what data scientists do. And doing it in this style allows other technologists to very quickly integrate with you. Um, I'll recommend, uh, like I said, here are three big tools. Pick one of these. Um, if you try and pick all three of these, you're not likely to learn them all very well. TensorFlow is the leading platform for doing deep learning. Spark is the leading platform for distributed computing. And uh, these cloud services are the leading tool for building large scale big data integration systems. So you should become or be working on becoming an expert in one of these areas, I would say. Um, you don't have to, to be a data scientist. You could be the best data scientist in the world at signal processing and for whatever reason you never touch these. Or maybe you specialize in e-commerce and these things aren't relevant in some way. Um, but if any of these interest you, I'd say pick one and only one and learn it pretty well. Um, also, know the tools of your organization. You're going to enter a lot of places in your career that are going to do things very differently. Um, you don't necessarily have to use what those companies use, but you should know it. So if you go into a company and everyone writes in Java and you plan to write in R, that's perfectly fine. But make sure you establish the mechanism by which you collaborate with your Java partners. You know, or, uh, how exactly will we make these code bases integrate? Solve that problem quickly so that there's no conflict or friction with being able to release stuff. Always talk to the software engineers. They're the guys who really know how systems work. They also know where a lot of the problems are. And oftentimes, if you get in good with these guys, they will start to learn where a data scientist can help and they will come to you rather than trying to invent uh, very poorly designed solutions of their own accord, like simple heuristics, rule-based systems. If you can collaborate closely, you can teach them where your expertise is and then uh, you can find different ways you can help your organization. Um, most of all, understand what I call how to make a frictionless impact. I've been in a lot of places where the data they had was so low quality, we couldn't do modeling. Um, and then, you know, my message to the employer was, hey, you have to get this fixed upstream. I can't garbage in, garbage out. I can't help you until, you know, this problem gets addressed. Um, but that could be a major monumental undertaking. So make sure when you're working on a problem, you know that you can control start to finish all the pieces to be a success and make it frictionless, which means if you rely on other people for something that are not reporting to you or not part of your team, that you try and minimize those needs as much as possible so that your work can be impactful. Um, in terms of business knowledge, as a data scientist, you bring a lot to the table that other people don't know. 
Um, everyone basically knows a little bit about web design at this point, right? Even if we don't know HTML, we all use the web constantly. We see sites we like. You know, we know when to recognize a web 3.0 site that's interactive and cool from like an out of date site. Um, knowledge of the web is common. Knowledge of data science is not. So figure out in your organization, who are your stakeholders? What are the decisions they need to make? Uh, you know, what's the organization, the structure, but um, especially figure out these decisions. If there's someone that has to make hard decisions and you think the data of the organization can help make them better, that's a winning combination. So get into a lot of conversations and figure out who you should be collaborating with. Because as uh, the former chief data scientist of the country used to say, uh, data science is a team sport. And I very much agree with that. Um, understand your path to value. A lot of first time, uh, first employed data scientists, especially at a company that is, doesn't have a lot of data scientists and doesn't have any major leadership, they're just getting their feet wet, so to speak. You can often in a scenario like that get put on a project that really doesn't matter. It's a sideline issue, someone's you know, brainchild idea. So whatever you're working on, figure out what is the real value to the organization? Um, what is the value of their data? And how can you use, that, you use that data to empower smarter decisions? If you can't change a decision the organization is making, then you're not bringing much value as a data scientist. So figure out how you can get that done. Um, like I said, I think you do that through conversations with your collaborators and your team members. Figure out what are the hard decisions of the company. And how can you make the company be smarter at making them? So um, a bit of uh, high level advice. If you wanna be a data scientist, be a scientist first. And that means you don't proclaim things, you produce theories and you test your theories and you expect failure and you iterate until you have a theory that's been proven. A good theory is consistent with the available data um, in a way that's saying that uh, you, know, you have a, a high accuracy or a good fit for the data. Um, it makes verifiable predictions about the future. That's a, another way of saying that it's not overfit. Whatever your work does, there has to be some way of exploiting that result and, and getting an advantage out of it. Lastly, it has to be falsifiable. Uh, and this is one that a lot of people struggle with. So falsification is the idea that you can prove something wrong. Um, now, how do you do that with a recommendation system? If it recommends a product and someone buys it, well, it seems like it did its job. The question is, could it have done better recommendations and therefore sold more products? And while you never really know, you can try and falsify that in a certain way. So maybe you should take a certain percentage of your traffic and show them a random list of products and see how many people buy there. If the random list sells as many products as the fancy recommendation list, then whatever you're doing probably isn't helping. So go back to the drawing board. You're willing to give up quick and try new ideas. Um, now showing random products might just be a silly result. Maybe you should show like, the, the recommendations that your system was kicking out three months ago before you'd made improvements and hopefully you should be able to measure the difference. There are approaches like that that are more practical. But at the end of the day, never fall in love with your theories. Always look for ways that they're not working so that you can make improvements. Um, to wind up, I'll talk a little bit about uh, opportunities. What I see that uh, are good places for people to get in. So career path, I can't stress this enough. You need to have a, career, a clear career path in mind for yourself. I talk to a lot of aspiring data scientists who say, I'm open to anything. I'll do whatever you want. I just want to learn. I'm eager. Just give me any problem and, I, and I'll work hard on it. To be honest with you, that's the worst possible answer you can give. Because it doesn't tell your future employer that you're bringing anything to the table. You can find ambitious people. What a company really needs is someone who's an expert, who is gonna to commit to solving a problem and really deliver on that. Now, do you know you're gonna be able to solve it? You can't know for sure, you don't wanna mislead anyone. But if you go in saying, I want a job, any job, you're not gonna get as far as someone who says, I'm dedicated to breaking into e-commerce or self-driving cars or whatever the case may be. And saying those words is easy. It's easy to, to go to a job interview and say, I'm interested in insert your industry here. And that's a fine start, but if you're genuine about it, you should know the other players. You should know what algorithms are popular in that space. You should know the data scientists who are working at the competitive companies and what their backgrounds are. Uh, that's how you become unique and set yourself apart. It's also how you identify how to get where you're going. When you see that certain data scientists at uh, competitive companies 
are very interested in Bayesian methods. Well, why? What are they applying the Bayesian methods for and how quickly can you learn the same? So while it's important to have a career, clear career path and go in very determined to an employer and say why you're the best fit for the job, and the answer is not because you'll try hard, it's because you have some advantage. Um, also, be willing to change your mind because it's, it's very likely your career path will be winding and your first couple jobs will shape that a lot. Uh, there's someone I went to school with that I was good friends with. At his first job, they introduced him to a technology called Salesforce. I want you guys to all look up Salesforce after this webinar and learn something about it if you don't already know. At the time, neither he or I had heard of Salesforce, but it turns out it's a very powerful technology used by a large number of companies. If you can become an expert in data science applied within the tools commonly in the Salesforce community, that will uniquely set you apart make your earnings much more, uh, give you a great, greater potential to earn more, but also make you give you the ability to plug into people who need that. Um, so when you go and search for jobs that say, hey, we need a Salesforce engineer who knows machine learning, there's not many people who can raise their hand and apply for that. If you're one of them, you get a strong advantage. So while Salesforce is an interesting one you should look at, I'm not saying everyone needs to get into it. Um, I'm not saying Salesforce will be around in 20 years. I really don't know. But it's a lucrative place to be today, and it's a specialization you should consider. If nothing else, you should know about it because it's very common in business. And it's, uh, it, it is the repository of a lot of companies' data. Um, lastly, community. I can't say enough about how much you'll learn and how far your career will be advanced by being a part of your local community through meetups, your colleagues and alumni, going to conferences, online groups. This is where you not only hear people who are further along on their career journey and tell their story of how they got where they are, but it's also where you meet peers and learn about the opportunities they're pursuing and the new technologies that are interesting. Um, lastly, just a bit on career advice. If you don't know about recruiters, you should ask around and learn about recruiters. This is how most people get first jobs. It's a weird sort of industry. So know if you're talking to a company or a recruiter, um, not super relevant for data science any different than other fields, but something you should know if you're early on your career path. Um, but as you are on your journey, realize that your first job should be a stepping stone, learning experience. Ideally, you have a manager who's a good mentor. That's how you learn a lot. And, uh, you know, close the search with many potential dead ends. When you're looking at you know, any job you can find, there's lots of opportunities. Picking one uh, over the other, you don't have to kill yourself on that decision. Get in somewhere that you can learn. Um, so the question you always want to ask yourself, what makes you attractive to your future employee? And it should be some combination of your skills, your experience, and your fit. So in terms of skills, we talked about the things you should know, um, some of the techniques, tools, and methods. Those are things you could practice and find learning resources for. Experience may be hard for you if you're early in your journey, but I gave a lot of recommendations for how you can uh, get yourself some experience, even if you're not finding jobs and internships and stuff like that. And most of all, fit. Companies want to find people that are a good match for their organization. And if you are active in the community or things like that, these can be a big advantage for you. I've known people who were selected to get jobs strictly because they were participants in hackathons or um, they're contributing to open source in some way. And it's not so much that those contributions were you know, breathtaking and, and earned them the job, but it just showed that they were a notch above other people for what that organization was looking for. Um, that's the presentation I had to run through. I'm happy to run through as much Q&A as you guys want to do. Um, I'm going to tap Randy here in case we've got a prioritized list of questions. Other than that, I can just go through and scroll kind of top down. I think you're on mute still, Randy. Andy, you need to, uh, yeah, okay. I'm muting the top. I just want to say you did really great, Kyle. That was a great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and one question that came up that was really interesting. I'm going to post it on the feed. All right. Nowadays, data science is a really hot subject, but there will come a time when schools will produce high quality, highly qualified data scientists with tailor-made formulations, or sorry, uh, formations. Um, the hype and number of jobs might go down. So here's my question. Do you believe that later, maybe 10 to 15 years, only highly qualified data scientists will be available to find jobs? I don't think so. Um, data science, I'm not sure that it's gonna go into decline in, in quite the way you're saying. 
yes, new tools will come about that automate things. There are already starting to be tools that automate basic machine learning. And if you have a very, very easy problem, it, you don't need a data scientist. You can plug in your spreadsheet and machine learning will work. But those tools need a little bit of training. Um, take, for example, I have a hobby. I do a little bit of carpentry. Anyone can do carpentry. I didn't go to school for it. I didn't really get all that much training. If you want to learn how to use a table saw, you can go learn it. It's not that hard. Data science is a little bit hard today because you know, there are challenges to learning it. And there's a lot to learn. That's becoming easier and the tools are getting easier. But still, not everyone wants to be a carpenter. Not everyone wants to be a data scientist. So if you know the tools and you can execute them, that's what counts. If anything, better tools and more advanced methods and more automation will just make you more able to do bigger tasks. You know, it's like if, if you were uh, trying to do deliveries and that was your business and you just did deliveries on a bicycle, you might have a successful courier service, but after a time you need to hire a vehicle and then a fleet of vehicles. And if you're the CEO of the company that owns, you know, a hundred trucks, you can do a lot of work. So I think if anything, the advancement will just mean data scientists are more impactful. Um, Tailor-made stuff, you will still need people to operate those solutions. So um, the more qualified you are, the more impact you can have, but data is not going anywhere. This is the new way businesses run. And at all levels, data, businesses and organizations will need help with it. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's good. That's uh, Jason. So, um, I would like to see um, when I talk with you know many hiring managers from uh, Silicon Valley, I notice that you know uh, two things change in this year, uh, twenty eighteen, and uh, you will see the the salary for the entry level data scientist is kind of uh, stable now. It's it, it's um, it will not increase, but for the senior data scientist, it has been you know increased significantly. So that means, you know, for the entry level data scientist is kind of, you know, the job opening is kind of stable, but for the senior guys, you know, who has three years or five years, you know, uh, machine learning, deep learning, and uh, NLP, natural language pro pro processing, you know, technology. For the senior, you know, data scientists, it's, there are a huge, you know, uh, job market there. And also you will see AI has been, you know, applied to data science more and more. You will see natural language processing. You will see uh, knowledge graph, uh, and also you know the traditional you know uh, artificial intelligence te technologies has been you know uh, applied in data science a lot. So I would like to see there will be um, you know the job opening is kind of you know uh, will be uh, still increasing, but you know. Uh, we have the challenge to see, you know, how to apply new technology in this, you know, data science industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, scrolling through some of the questions, I'll do a few more. Uh, best way to learn data science. I kind of covered this. I think my answer is get your hands dirty. Don't worry about how big the field is. Look at the people you know, in your local community you admire or find the job descriptions you wish you had, even the job you think you're not qualified for. Um, and print that job description out and hang it on your wall and say, how do I get to this point? If it says it requires TensorFlow, Postgres, and uh, I don't know, uh, ECS, go learn those technologies. Um, learn the ones you need for the job you want. And there was another interesting question I wanted to add. So a lot of our viewers, they're like students or people trying to transition into the field. And this question kind of pops up that I see very often. So it would be great if you could answer this. Uh, what is the standard of a good enough portfolio that can show off data science skills? Uh, good question. I would say the first standard is, are you proud of it? Are you willing to show it to somebody? And if you are, it should be good to go. It's really what you want to achieve. Do you want to work on Jeffrey Hinton's team and do advanced deep learning? Well, if you want that, you need really good qualifications. Or do you, would you rather just work for um, one of the first few companies you could find that offers you a good opportunity and maybe doesn't have a big brand name or something like that? Um, you might be qualified to get into that role. So. The portfolio should show off very specific skills that you have 
that are beyond just sort of your casual, uh, you know, things that you find on people's blogs and demos. Show something unique about yourself that stands out and uh, it's something you're proud of that you think the people you want to show it to would apply. Okay, so uh, this is Jason. So I would like to see, you know, uh, in your portfolio, um, I would like to see three uh, areas. First, you know, I would like to see your programming, you know, skills, your R, Python, and uh, database, especially, you know, the SQL programming. And also I would like to see uh, you have the knowledge about, you know, statistics, machine learning, but the, the most important one is, you know, please put some, you know, a real world case in your portfolio. You can check in, you know, your code in uh, Kaigo, check in that to uh, uh, GitHub to show, you know, you, you work on some, you know, um, real business, you know, uh, problem. For instance, you know, you do user segmentation, you do some, you know, uh, prediction. So, you know, that, um, that may make you outstanding from all the candidates. Uh, let me repeat that. Okay, first, we would like to see programming skills. Second, we would like to see uh, you do machine learning, uh, statics, you know, mo modeling. Last one is the top important one. We would like to see some, you know, uh, real solution for the business, you know, um, problem. And one more question that I found really interesting. I'm gonna post it right now. Oh, you're muted, Kyle. Okay. Got it, thank you, sorry about that. Uh, so I understand that clean, well-organized, I guess, data can significantly simplify a data scientist's job. What's a good standard by which to evaluate the cleanliness of the data? What does well-organized data typically look like? Really good question. Um, and this is an area I think some people have a misunderstanding about. There's this phrase, I don't know how it got started, but we say, data scientists spend 80% of our time cleaning the data. And it's said kind of with some disgust, like uh, we don't like it and we're janitors and we want to have better use of our time. And to some degree, this is true. I've seen many organizations where the data is of low quality because the organization didn't take data seriously. They let their engineers make poor choices in how they recorded the data. They changed the recording. They didn't track everything. Uh, or the tracking had some issues in certain ways. This is when your data is essentially broken. And you can't go back in time, so you can't fix it. And when that happens, all of the uh, bad things fall onto the plate of the data scientists, and they have to try and reconcile or make some use of what's available. But that's the worst case scenario for data cleaning. Data cleaning can also just be a very healthy exercise by which you're coming to understand your organization's data. Every data set has outliers in it, no matter what. If you're dealing, unless it's a trivial, simple toy data set for a very small company, if it's of any consequence, I guarantee you there are outliers. And those outliers aren't necessarily mistakes. It's not like you'll go in and find, you know, a, a customer who's a fake order and you need to clean it out. That's, that's dirty data. But you'll also find like, hey, there's one customer in here who spends thousands more than the other customers. Why is it here? What does it represent? And maybe you'll find out that that's like a wholesaler deal or something like this will happen. And you might have to pull that data point out of your model to get a good result. Whatever the case, you going through and asking all the questions about the data is how you learn a lot of domain expertise. So that cleaning, in terms of is your data clean and well organized, the real question is, is it in a good enough shape that you can apply an algorithm to it? If it is, you're ready to go. If the algorithm's result is not useful or is overfit or doesn't make sense, then either the, you can't do the prediction or the data is not clean enough to do it. And that's your skill as a data scientist to figure out which it is. Well, that wraps up everything. I'm not sure if you have more time to ask more questions. If not, I can conclude this session. I'm trying to scroll through. There's a lot of great oh, yeah, questions. We lot. could be here all day. Um, so sorry to anybody we missed. Um, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to try and uh, do some follow-ups. Um, we've covered some of these. Here's a good one. 
Uh, why did you mention logistic regression exclusively? There are other models like tree-based models and SVMs. Yes, uh, I mentioned logistic regression exclusively because it's sort of fundamental. You should learn that one before you learn the others because as much as it's simple and it doesn't have like the, uh, the sex appeal of some of the more advanced algorithms, you'll learn a lot more if you really understand logistic regression and, and you'll be able to learn the other algorithms uh, more effectively. Also, people look down on it for a lot of reasons that aren't appropriate. It's widely used in industry and very useful in a lot of cases. Um, I did mention a tree-based method though, XGBoost. I didn't mention the more popular random forest or the C4.5 or cart or any of those. Um, also very good. XGBoost, in my opinion, happens to be one of the better, if not the best tree-based approaches out there. So I did have that one in. Um, XGBoost is also a very complicated algorithm. You'll have a lot harder time understanding it than logistic regression. But if you get both of those, you're in a good place. I left off support vector machines on purpose. While they are a very interesting and useful data structure and, and algorithm, they aren't, in my experience, all that widely applied because they don't scale up very well. So um, it's a technique you should know, but I don't see it as widely used. That's why I didn't include SVMs. Yeah, this is Jason. So uh, we saw a lot of, you know, um, people ask about, you know, this data science boost camp. It will start, I think, next week, right? Uh, March 10. Randy, it's a start from March 10, right? Yeah, correct. Okay, so um, I saw a lot of, you know, um, attendees, they ask, you know, um, you know, uh, the content for this, you know, boost camp and uh, what kind of skills we were working on. And we don't have the time for the question yet. But uh, let me see if you are interested in the Bruce Camp. Here is a, the contact info. You can send an email to info at ideas.org. And also you can send an email to data science at dataapplab.com. You can use your, you know, uh, your cell phone to take a picture on the screen. So you can have the, the email there. Uh, after you please, you know, send us your uh, application and also your resume. So we can do a quick review by Kyle and I and then we can, you know, get back to you very soon. Thank you, Randy. That's, uh, that's yeah, all from my side. I want to add, so thank you so much for attending this conference. And again, we're planning on doing this maybe bi-weekly or, or weekly, depending on how successful, successful it is. But again, we're trying to promote our new bootcamp. We have really great data science mentors, as you can see for yourself. Kyle did an amazing presentation. So big thanks to you for giving us a great presentation on that. We learned a lot. And we also have Jason, we also have Peter, who unfortunately couldn't attend. And in regards to the boot camp, I'll be the TA, as well as Christian. I'm not sure if you can see him. But we have two TAs, three mentors, and just 16 weeks of a lot of data science. So if you're really interested, I sent out a link. You can apply. If you need more information, just send me a message on LinkedIn. Cool. Yeah, so that's about it. If you guys want to do any conclusions or farewell. Yeah, first, you know, I would like to, you know, thank you, Cal, to make a, you know, a fantastic, you know, presentation. And uh, good luck to everyone. Definitely. Take care. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.